I was nine years old when uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed. We were living in Chilmark. I was living with my grandparents, my mother, and my brother. And we lived in an old house with no electricity, no plumbing, and no running water. My mother chose to tell us about the bombing of Pearl Harbor on that night as she was getting us ready for bed. We were somber and somewhat frightened. My brother was seven, I was nine. And my mother insisted that it was all happening very far away and nothing would affect us in any way. The next day, we had our first and only air raid alarm on the vineyard. More about that later. The preparations for war were all around us. Volunteer air raid wardens were making nightly house calls to make sure that drapes were pulled tight in front of windows, not allowing any of the light from kerosene lamps to escape. Electricity didn't come to Chilmark until after the war. It made Chilmark a very dark place at night. We were even required to paint the top half of the headlights on our old Model A, paint them black so that the light would not be reflected up. The household entered into the war effort with vigor. My mother was an air aid warden and a USO hostess. My grandfather gave up his ball of lead foil from his tobacco pouches that he had been building into a huge ball for many years. My grandmother rolled bandages and my brother and I collected medals. I had my picture in the Gazette along with Matt Poole because the two of us collected the most keys for the war effort. I have no idea how they use the keys. Food was rationed. We planted a huge victory garden in front of the house and we ate our chickens and ducks. I remember we had to go to town hall and pick up books of ration stamps. Gas was rationed too. Food came to Chilmark in a wagon from SBS, which was a grocery store in those days on Main Street in Vineyard Haven, and they had this truck that came up island once a week. You could get your fresh meat cut to your taste right from the back of the truck, and Chilmark's store was open every day in those days for your basics, so we very seldom went down island. The military presence started to build up quickly uh, just before the war. The Army Signal Corps put up a radar station at Peaked Hill a few miles from our house, and that was several months before Pearl Harbor Day. Then uh, the Coast Guard in the other direction took over a house at Squibnocket and began patrolling the beaches. All this activity created a buzz in town, which didn't go away until the war ended. The servicemen were seen often and everywhere around town. They gathered every evening at Rex Weeks' store, still called the Chilmark store, to collect the mail and wait for the evening papers. It was a fun time to be at the store with the men from both services joining in a general social hour. They developed an interest in the town and the school. Groups of them would visit the school in the afternoon and the teachers, who were of course their primary interest, would give up our classes, which was fine with us, and have us all sing popular songs and then we were often driven home in the Jeeps. It was a great treat every afternoon when we saw those Jeeps coming to the school. The boys, as everyone referred to them, were all very young and homesick. Many of them came from cities around the country, very far from the sea. My grandmother volunteered and took on the task of writing to many parents and assuring them that Chilmark was a good place to be stationed. She corresponded with many parents and then veterans for the rest of her life. My mother cooked and cooked. The cooks at both stations eventually began bringing her food. And I remember one Thanksgiving when the tables extended into the bedrooms and we served turkey dinners to men from both stations in shifts for hours. The cooks at the stations had provided the turkeys and fixings. It was great fun for us children, needless to say. The cooks often gave us food that the servicemen wouldn't eat. I remember a large can of figs in our house for a very long time. <laughs> a word about the USO. Women from around the island volunteered as hostesses and chaperones and went weekly uh, to Vineyard Haven to uh, hostess the dances. My mother was one of the hostesses and she transported several of the single girls from Chilmark to to the dances. In the end, she found she had fostered two Chilmark romances, Bette Carroll, who married a soldier, and Barbara Seward, who married a Coast Guard serviceman. Many Down Island girls also found husbands amongst the servicemen. Then came the real war. We knew about the Navy's air station down on the Edgartown Plains, as the location was referred to then. 
we heard the night flights and we heard the many sad stories of planes that didn't come back. We knew when things were bad because at night we would go, we would see the flares being dropped offshore and drifting toward the island. Many of us children searched out and often found the spent flares on the end of their silk parachutes. I clearly recall crawling around in the briars and shrubs, untangling the lines and carefully picking the silk off the thorns to retrieve parachutes. Toward the end of the war, we would comb the beaches for the practice bombs that often came ashore. For many years afterwards, you could find a few in every yard, barn, and house in Chomark, as we were all good beachcombers. The day after the Pearl Harbor bombing, there was a warning of enemy aircraft approaching the island. It was not a drill. The air raid wardens began their duties and came to the school to evacuate us to safety. It was an exciting and fearful time. I recall that some of us were driven home while others had to wait in the school for what seemed like hours for the car to return. There was just the one Model A. My mother was doing her warden duties. She fell through the school steps that day and became the only casualty of that um, operation, and we never let her forget it. I remember being very frightened that afternoon, but by the next day it was all a grand adventure. No one ever told us why that alarm was sounded. We never did hear. Uh, for the duration of the war, the nights were the dramatic and scary times. As I told you earlier, the training flights could be heard coming and going. Some nights there were strange throbbing engine noises clearly heard in our living room. Those nights, my grandmother would call the Coast Guard to report it, and they most often could hear it too, and agreed that it was a submarine surfaced in the lee of Squibnocket charging its batteries. This actually happened often. The subs were never identified by country of origin to us. This mysterious activity took its toll on the young men assigned to patrol the beaches in the dark of night. Some enjoyed the adventure but some suffered from the fear and dread of meeting an enemy coming ashore in a rubber raft. I did hear that this actually happened and there were constant rumors that it had happened. It was pretty much accepted that spies had been put ashore on the vineyard. We heard stories of messages left in mailboxes, mysterious lights flashing toward the sea and rubber rafts found hidden at the base of the cliffs. One night we did see an automobile, we saw automobile lights on the cliffs sending flashing signals to sea. We never went looking to find out what was going on. I don't remember being particularly frightened by all of it. The children certainly discussed it all and we always kept an eye out for something different in our rambles around town. One night my grandmother heard a plane flying low over the house. She rushed to a window in time to see a plane go down in the sound off Dogfish Bar. She immediately called the Coast Guard, and for several days after that, we had many military visitors, some army, all asking to be shown exactly what she had seen. It was an exciting time, and it was all very mysterious. We never knew why that unfortunate crash held so much interest, but many years later, a fishing boat snagged the wreckage, and the military came immediately to get it. Another plane uh, crashed on Middle Road in a field in what's now called Brookside Farm. On our way home from school that day, the bus driver stopped the bus and let us all out to go take a look at the plane. The pilot had survived and, the, and was not there, and the trucks had already uh, arrived to take the plane back to uh, Edgartown. At the beginning of the beach patrol, single Coast Guardsmen had to walk alone from Squ Squibnocket to Kwan Su. They walked the beaches and they carried time clocks that had to be keyed at each end of the walk. It was a dark walk. You can imagine the shadows of the rocks against the cliffs. Some young men who had never seen the ocean were timid and some downright scared. The youngsters in town enjoyed walking with the men during the daylight hours, but they were very much alone in the dark. There were stories of men hurting themselves so that they wouldn't have to do their patrols. They eventually added a second man to the patrols and they made a path along the top of the dunes and cliffs. If any of you go to Lucy Vincent, you'll see that there are remnants of that path still there. That was somewhat better, although before the war ended, they brought dogs in to walk with the men. I also vividly remember standing at the tops of the cliff on a beautiful sunny day 
in the early days of the war, watching convoys of ships pass the other side of Nomans going to Europe, silent, dark, and foreboding. It seemed that they took all day to pass, and I think they probably did. The, the same years we would watch and listen to squadrons of aircraft flying over Chilmark on their way to Europe. Again, it seemed like they were flying for hours at a time. And what's interesting is the different makes of plane would fly in different formations. You'd see the big bombers maybe in sets of four and the lighter planes in sets of eight. I mean, that's I don't recall exactly the numbers, but that was the way it would appear. For hours, it, uh, they would fly over in these various groupings. And I can still hear that hum of all those engines. That was creepy. We didn't like that sound. And when we hear it, we'd go out and actually we'd lie on our backs, my brother and I, and watch so we could see them passing over. Then there was the afternoon three destroyers anchored off Menemsha Beach, and we were all told that President Roosevelt was going to meet Churchill and Stalin in Yalta. We, all, we always told ourselves that the president was aboard as we all went to Menemsha to look, although I heard many years later that he joined the ships much closer to Europe. And finally uh, came the end of the hostilities. It happened in August when the summer people were still with us. So my mother jumped in the Model A and tried to spread the word of joy to all the people in the camps. And soon people were walking down to the town hall to share in the excitement. The Model A died in the field, and that may have been the end of it. Um, I don't remember, but it did get us through the war years. The group at town hall had be fast become a party. Of course, I was sent home to bed, but the story still lives about how Roger Allen, selectman at the time and senior of the Allen farm, went back to his barn and got a bottle of hooch that had come ashore during Prohibition. And because he was not a drinking man, he had saved it in his barn all those years to break it out to join, to entertain at the festivities of the end of the war. I hope that gives you a little idea of what it was like to be young in Chomak during the war.